Um, we've been talking about parables. Uh, Pastor Andy's been preaching about parables. Phenomenal series. Uh, summer series as we just think of the stories that Jesus told and how it, it incredibly affects us as we understand those. And uh, it's been a, a, maybe a couple months back and Andy said, well, you're going to preach on this Sunday and preach on whatever parable you want, except for the ones that I've already outlined. So he, he, he thought he took all the good ones. No, nah, no, no, impossible. Uh, and I really was thinking about, I've never preached on this parable before because I just really don't like it. <laughs> but I, the Lord prompted me, uh, go, go there. So I'm going to talk about what I'm calling the parable of the generous landowner. I, I know it's different in the Bible. It says the parable of the vineyard workers. But I'm going to read that today, uh, 16 verses. You track with us as we read that. And uh, then I'm just going to tell a story. Uh, uh, so here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So what did he do? He hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. And at noon, again, at, at, at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. From 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one has hired us. And the landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. Then those hired at 5 o'clock were paid. Each received a full day's wage. Then those hired first came to get their pay. They assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, yet you pay them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money. Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination with me a little bit today. Uh, I, I'm going to tell a story, but we're going to uh, and, and talk about this particular one that spoke up at the end of the day. And can imagine what his life would have been like with his family. And I've given this worker a name just so it'll track with the story. And we're going to call our worker this morning that's in this story, Arenas. Arenas is his name. So you use your imagination as I tell the story of Arenas and his day working in the vineyard. Arenas' eyes snapped open. He was deep in sleep. But he could hear the desert winds relentlessly blowing in the trees outside and whistles through the cracks and crevices of his house. Years of working as a day laborer in the vineyards taught him that these winds really meant something. It was the time of the scorching heat and the grapes had to be harvested quickly. These winds would soon be followed by heavy rains and even more destructive high winds. The grapes would be lost unless they could be harvested quickly. Arenas thought to himself, that's good news for me. That meant there would be work. It, meet, it meant bread for his family. The endless cycle of poverty would be broken for at least a time. As he got to the marketplace early, he was sure that he would be hired. With a surge of hope, uh, he, he quickly dressed that morning. The sun was peeking over the horizon. He was joined by other, several others in the marketplace, hoping for a day's work. Strangely, one of the vineyard owners was already there. He too probably sensed the urgency of the harvest and needed all the hands he could hire before the rains came. 
The negotiations for the day's wage were quickly taken care of. A denarius. It was the going rate for sunup to sundown labor. It was now 6 a.m. and Arenas went to work. The early morning hours in the vineyard were usually the cool and the best time to work, at least more pleasant for the workers. But today, it was already hot, early in the morning. He gathered grapes as quickly as he could. He had much experience with his hands. He had been trained for years of hard labor. He looked across the vineyard. He thought to himself, we're we're never going to get all these grapes in by sundown. But at 9 o'clock, the owner returned to the marketplace to hire more workers. Arena speculated they would be paid probably a little bit less than a full day's wage. But the owner would be glad to have the help. Only nine hours left in the day. It would take every hand to finish on time. But the nine o'clock crew wouldn't be enough either. The shadow was sprinting across the sundial, and the winds and the rain would come soon, and Arenas, he stole a glance at the owner again, whose expression seemed concerned. He wasn't surprised when the Owner disappeared and returned from the marketplace at noon to hire more workers. By now, men from other villages were seeking work that they couldn't find in their own village. Yet even more workers were hired at three in the afternoon. And as the afternoon sun began to cast a long shadow, the rows of the still unharvest grapes were there left to be picked. Yet they were still surprised the owner returned to the marketplace at five to see if he could hire more men. There would be a little more than an hour or so for them to work. As each crew was hired, Arenas calculated what each would earn for their portion of labor. He even mused over the possibility of maybe even making more than was promised because he had been there all day working. He could almost feel the coins in his hands. Finally, at the end of the day, it came and the workers lined up for their pay. And Arenas was amazed when five o'clock workers were called to be paid first. All eyes were fixed on the uh, landowner as he handed over the wages. Shock swept over the workers as the owner paid each a full denarius. How could this be? It meant one of two things in his mind. Either the others would be paid More? Well, he knew this owner. That was likely not going to happen. Then all of a sudden he felt a surge of greed. He was already in his mind multiplying. Well, I worked all day for one denarius, but they just got paid a denarius. How could that be? Maybe I'm going to get 12. Then the owner placed a single denarius in his hand. Arenas couldn't take it any longer. Uh, He he burst into a blast of indignation. He said, that's not fair. I've been here all day. There's no justice, no reward for hard work. What's the use of working 12 hours if somebody that came and only worked one in the cool of the evening earns the same amount? He was so angry, he threw the coin on the ground at the owner's feet. Keep your denarius. The owner looked at the other guys hired the first hour. He saw the disappointment mixed with anger on their faces too. The owner, deeming down, picked up the denarius, looked back at Arenas. He said, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't I agree to pay you for the day's work? Take your pay and go. If you want to give the man who was hired last, if I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I'm giving you, then that's up to me. And I began to think about that parable, and it's hard not to sympathize with the guys hired the first hour, isn't it? If we're honest, we don't really understand that. In fact, we feel for them. In my mind, I can hear their complaint echoing, and I'm thinking, yeah. And I thought to myself, if there was an America way of thinking, it just doesn't seem fair. It really strikes against our sense of equal pay for equal work. If modern unions had existed in ancient Israel, there would have been a protest. A strike would have been called against the landowner. None of the grapes would have been harvested on time. 
Somehow this parable seems to rub us the wrong way. I've even heard people say that this parable offends them. Guess what? This parable is not an isolated event. The Gospels are filled with stories where the unexpected order of things is tossed aside From the outset, it seems like maybe God is bad at math. Why would you ever pay a guy who works one hour the same as the guy who works all day? But when does it make sense to leave 99 sheep to go after one? How did you justify spending a retirement nest egg to wash someone's feet? Since when does two cents amount to the same as $100? As in the story of the widow's mite. Those don't make sense. In some way of thinking, these are scandalous mathematics of grace. This isn't economics. This is kingdom thinking. It's not what we deserve. It's what we need. It's not the simple two plus two equals four, because when God is involved, your X factor... You plus me multiplied is more than you can ever imagine. In kingdom economics, God dispenses gifts, not wages. In kingdom economics, value is not measured by what you and I deserve, but how much you've given. In kingdom economics, the heart counts more than the bottom line. In kingdom economics, even one is worth everything. In kingdom economics, giving up everything is the way to win it all. God is not the one that's bad at math, folks. We are the ones who have switched the price tags on everything. A couple examples. In in, uh, 2013, Macy's advertised a $1,500 necklace at a 10% discount. And they accidentally put a wrong price in, and they priced it for $47. The the mistake was quickly caught, but not before the Dallas Macy's Macy's completely sold out of their inventory for $47. Heard another story a few years ago, an eBay seller listed a bottle of, I don't know much about this, this is what the article said, Alsop's Arctic Ale. And it was brewed in 1852. It was priceless. The problem was that the person that listed forgot one of the letters in the name Alsop. And so everybody thought it was a joke, except for one eagle eyed shopper who won the auction on the bid for $304 and turned around a few weeks later and sold it for a half a million. See, I give those illustrations and say, we've done the same thing. We've taken things that are of great value and worth, and we've swapped them for pennies on the dollar. We've traded in eternal glory, our eternal glory for dollar store trinkets that will break before we even get them home. Listen, folks, we've pawned our marriages, our children, our values, our character, our integrity to buy a few cheap thrills and fleeting amusements. What kingdom economics does is set everything back to its proper value. God's new math switches all the price tags back to where they're supposed to be. See, Jesus challenges us in a new way by teaching us and stretching our minds He actually wants us to weigh things on the scale of the heavenly worth and what they're worth in heaven. And I think to really understand this parable that we read this morning, we need to see it for what it is and why Jesus told it. And to do that, we need to go back to the chapter before in Matthew 19. Jesus is approached there. It's a familiar story by a rich young man. Uh, in chapter 19, verses 16 through 24. We learn from the other Gospels is this man is a scholar in the Jewish law. He's a religious expert in Jewish eyes. If there was anyone who had the inside track to God's kingdom, it seemed to be this man. 
But Jesus knew that he loved his wealth more than he loved God. So when Jesus told him to sell all he had and give to the poor, he went away. This man went away very disappointed. Jesus then talked about how difficult it was for a rich person to enter heaven because the enticement of wealth is so great. Now, you got to understand, though the disciples were there, they were hearing all of this. They had seen this. And probably they realized, that, and they should have realized, that everyone has something in their hearts that could keep them out of the kingdom. Let's turn it on us today. Possibly every one of us here today has something on our hearts that could keep us out of the kingdom. Here was this God-fearing man. He obeyed all the laws. He lived a good life. He avoided sin. He just couldn't surrender his control of his wealth. Maybe the disciples were thinking, wouldn't there be some sort of thing in every person's life? They might have even wondered, can anybody be saved? And Jesus addresses the heart of their concern. Eternal life is not about what we've earned or how we perform. Salvation is not something God owes us for what we've done. It is something he freely gives because we desperately need it. It is impossible for man to be saved on his own power. But with God's power, it's possible for anyone to be saved. That's what Jesus responds there back in chapter 19, verse 26. The, year, the rich young man in chapter 19 gone away uh, sad because he, he loved his wealth. I just imagine, in my mind, Peter was chewing on this fact of what Jesus has just said. And then here's Peter, what, what he was thinking. It just came out. That's Peter. He couldn't help it. And he said, we, we've not held on to our wealth. In fact, we've given up everything, Jesus, to follow you. We've sacrificed all we have. Uh, maybe we'll get an extra reward in heaven. Peter being Peter, Peter just bursts it out. Verse 27 of chapter 19. Jesus answers saying that our reward in heaven will far outweigh anything. We give up in this life, verses 28 and 29 of chapter 19 of Matthew. But Jesus ends this statement with a riddle. It's very familiar to the same riddle that he gave at the end of the story of the parable we just read. And Jesus tells the, the parable we read after he repeats this. In this riddle, he says, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now he says that at the end of chapter 19, and then he goes on and tells this parable we read this morning about the parable of the vineyard workers. And when he gets all done, in verse 16, so those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. In between those two statements, almost exactly alike is the parable of the workers, what I call the generous landowner. And for centuries, uh, this parable has been called the workers in the vineyard. But I think it'd be very accurate to call it the parable of the generous landowner. Jesus isn't teaching a lesson on economics here. This isn't about fair labor practices. This is all about the generosity and goodness of the landowner ultimately the generosity and grace of God extended to us. Despite how upset the workers were at the first hour when they were paid the wage they agreed on, it was a commonly accepted wage for the day. It was a wage for which they had agreed to work. It was a sufficient wage to supply their needs and provide for their families. So the landowner paid them what they needed to be paid. However, he also gave the other workers what they also needed. Not what they deserved, but what they needed. Did you catch that? Anything less... 
they would not be able to feed their families. Can you imagine if the guy hired the last hour trying to make it with only one twelfth of a living wage? I mean, it's what he earned. He probably wouldn't expect it anymore. But Jesus saw beyond that and he saw his need. And Jesus sees beyond all the issues, all the struggles, all the heartache, all the difficulty that we go through and supplies our need. It's the same with us. God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we need, no matter how little we deserve, no matter how insufficient our effort is god gives us what we need see salvation is not about what we deserve it's about what god gives to us it's not about how hard we work no matter how good we are if if god only gives us what we deserve we can never earn him enough we're all bound for hell we are not perfect we are not sinless we can never hope to earn salvation our only hope is for god to give us what we need not what we deserve very clearly god is like the generous landowner he gives us gives all who come to him what they need now i want to use the last few minutes of our our time together this morning just to ask some questions some questions like what does this parable mean for our lives this morning and then we'll answer that with a series of questions that you will need to think about these are questions to search and to probe the first question is this how about you are you truly grateful for your salvation Are you truly overflowing with thanks for what God has done for you? Or do you act like you sort of earned it? I know you've never said that and you never would, but as your attitude shows that you think you deserve it, God owes it to you. Some of you may be even a little bit like me. And I grew up in the church uh, you've been a Christian maybe much of your life. You tend to see yourself as one of the workers hired the first hour. And it's not that this parable is hard to understand. It's that it's so hard to accept. I understand it. I just don't like it. Maybe it's because we're this red, white, and blue Americans Or maybe it's just human nature that we see ourselves as the first hour workers. Uh, This parable is going to rub us the wrong way if that's how we feel. We notice that not all the workers were grateful for what they were paid. Some were more than grateful for what they were paid. They were surprised at what they got. Except for the ones that started early in the morning. Everybody else got more than what they deserved. But here's the truth today. Every one of us are workers hired late in the day. Even the first hour workers received grace. The landowner didn't have to hire them. He didn't have to pay them what he did. They were dependent upon his goodness to pay what he promised. All of us, no matter when or how we become Christians... All of us, no matter how long we've been serving the Lord, are dependent upon the grace and goodness of God. And if God gave us what we truly deserved, none of us would be here. We'd all be bound for hell. Here's a second question. What is your motivation for serving God? What's your motivation for what I would call ministry? We're all, if we're believers in Christ, we're all in ministry. We have a ministry that God has called us to, something that only we can do to give to the body, to help others. So what's your motivation? There are a lot of reasons people might get involved. There are a lot of things that drive people to serve. It could be out of sense of of duty or guilt. It might 
be a desire to look good in the eyes of others. You, you might be trying to earn your salvation. You're striving to be good enough to get in heaven. But none of us are getting into heaven. Don't forget, none of us are getting into heaven because of how long we work or, or how hard. It's not about what we deserve. Instead, we need to be serving out of gratitude because we're thankful for what we've been given. Way more than we deserve. We've been given what we need. Here's question three. Are you living your life in such a way to be first in this life or the next? At the end of the day, when the workers are all paid, this story represents the end of time and the final judgment when we give an accounting of our lives. It's payday, if you will. You can live your life only for the rewards that you get in this life and simply ignore or neglect the next life, or you can live for the rewards of eternity. So what are you living for? Temporary trinkets or eternal treasure? That's a question only you can answer. See, eternity has a way of leveling the playing field. Maybe this has something to do with what Jesus said about the last being first and the first being last. I, I, just this last week as I was mulling over and preparing for this morning, I looked back at a list of celebrity deaths in 2023. And it's a pretty long list, maybe 30 well-known people. That if you said the name, 80% of us would know who those people those names anyway. We might not know a lot about them. Each one of them were powerful, successful in their own way, whether in music, business, television, movies, literature. On earth, they were among the first. They were the front of the line, the top of the ladder, the head of the pecking order, so to speak. But in death, none of that matters. Eternity doesn't care how much money was in your bank, how many Emmys or Grammys you won, how many bestsellers you wrote. It doesn't care how many fans wore your jersey or or even how many times you were elected. Anytime I think about eternity, I think back to funerals just a few weeks back. Did a couple of them in 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 the same week. And I think we think as we think about death, we, what we hope for is that when our time here is up, we hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter now into the reward. Right? And Jesus said, I got a different economy. If you're thinking about eternity, it's way different than what it is on earth. Here's the thing about kingdom economics of grace. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad it was. God's grace covers it just the same. Even the very last can be the first in heaven's accounting. And that's not up to us. That's up to God. Thank goodness. It doesn't matter when you come to him, whether you're the first hour of your life or the last. But... Let me tell you, when you come to him, is important. It is clear that those who come to Jesus at the end of their life miss out on a lifetime of joy and intimacy with God. And that is huge. So don't just think, oh, I'm not going to miss anything if I somehow can come to Christ at the end of my life. No, you're missing so much. So much joy. So much peace. Kingdom economics offers God's forgiveness and salvation just the same. It doesn't matter what you did before you came to him. And so I come to the last question that the Lord has prompted me to write down today. Is there any here today that maybe even be thinking it might be too late for me? 
there any here that have thought that? You think too much of your life has passed for it to make a difference now? You think that what you've done earlier in life will keep you, keep God from loving you now? Maybe some are thinking that. Thought about those guys that the landowner hired later in the day. We could easily say, well, why weren't they there? Weren't they responsible? Were they lazy? Did they have a legitimate excuse for not being there earlier? Why were they late? Maybe their wife or child was sick. We don't know. And guess what? It really doesn't matter. The landowner gave them what they needed. God will give you what you need if you just come to him. There's always room in the vineyard for one more. It doesn't matter how late in the day. It doesn't matter what you uh, were doing before. God's kingdom always has room for you and one more. I'm so glad of that. I'm glad it's not my economy that says, that's not fair. I'm so glad I don't... uh, I've had those attitudes. That is not fair. Lord, forgive me. But instead, it should be, praise God, one more. One more. One more. The Bible is very clear. If you confess with your mouth that Christ is raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's a start. Every one of us needs to start there. If we confess our sins, he, I believe Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the God that died for you, that loves you, that says there's always time for one more.